John Whalen, he was called Jack by his friends, he was called the enforcer by the people he came to collect money for, uh, was six foot four, more or less, 230 pounds, big guy. Um, they knew him as the enforcer because he went out and collected debts that were owed to bookies. Conversely, if a bookie owed you money and didn't pay, you could hire him. He'd beat up the bookie, too. He didn't care. He was a handsome, dashing guy as a teen. His father, uh, who was a career criminal, made a lot of money and put his son through a very elite military academy. He didn't want his son to have the life he did, but he had the life his father did anyway. Uh, so he played polo with the rich and famous. World War II, he taught himself to fly a bombardier, a bomber. Uh, and after the war, he married into a very rich LA family. But by 1955, the call of the streets was just too powerful. He, he began his criminal career. He didn't have to, but he did. He was, as I said, primarily a collector for bad debts. He was never known to carry a gun or a knife. He worked mostly for the LA crime families, uh, made guys, mobsters. He did know Benny Siegel, he worked with him. He worked with the Shannon brothers, who I have to tell you, I'd never heard of. Joe, Izzy, Mo, and Max, never heard of him. And occasionally he did work with Mickey Cohen, the man who killed him. But Whalen also had other aspirations. He was listed on his occupation as an actor. And actually, he was 38 years old when he died. He did have a SAG card, he was hard to get. And he was an actor. He had bit roles in four episodes of a TV show called The Restless Gun. And he also uh, was very good friends with the show's producer, an epic TV writer named David Dortort, Dortort, and who was then going to put uh, Whale in a new series he was going to make called Bonanza. Uh, but that didn't quite work out. Because on December 2, 1959, on that night, uh, Whalen wandered into a very popular uh, L.A. eatery, Rundelli's, and uh, was shot directly between the eyes by Mickey Cohen. And that ended everything. It happened at before midnight, right? around 1140 at night. Uh, Cohen was at table 15, his favorite table. Uh, he was with his guys, uh, a party of about 18, 19 people. Uh, according to to the witnesses to the shooting, all of whom were in Cohen's party. The other folks, the waiters, the cooks, they didn't see, they didn't know nothing about nothing. And so the cops had to rely on Cohen's testimonies. They said Whalen kicked in the door from the, he came in from the kitchen, he threw the door aside, you know, those swinging doors things. He walked through the bar area, they watched him, he looked, they said, like he was furious about something. He came over to a phone booth where one of uh, uh, Cohen's party was, this guy, Tony Reno. His real name was Anthony uh, Amarino. He was an amateur singer, that kind of thing. And he's on the phone. Amarino's on the phone. He's trying to make a call. What? Here's what the problem was. Al Levitt was a bookie in L.A. And Whalen worked for him to collect loans. He, the book, he claimed that this guy who was also there that night, who was also with Cohen's party named Pisatelli, owed him 900 bucks. And Pisatelli said, no, you owe me. Uh, you only paid me uh, uh, 50 bucks. I won 250. You paid me 150. You got to pay me the rest. So the book, he said, yeah, I'm not going to deal with this crap. And he told Whalen, go find this guy and slap him around. Give me my money back. So Whalen walks in, he sees Imarino, the singer, on the telephone. He grabs him, he, he says, look, I, where's your pal, Piscatelli? Imarino starts to say, look, I think there's just been a big misunderstanding. You don't understand what's going on. Whalen reaches into the phone booth, drags him out, and turns him around, spins him around, throws him into the main dining room, and he says, according to them now, where are your two pals? Where are those two Dagos you came with? Where are those two Dago bastards? They're going, to, they're going to go. Are they here? Whalen uh, then pushes uh, Marino over to table 15, where he sees Piscatella, who's sit, seated not far from Cohen. He, he grabs him uh, by the shoulder, and he tries to pick him up, and he says something, I, I want to talk to you outside. Piscatella says, no, I'm not talking to you. Get out, get out of here. Supposedly, I, again, he may have happened, I don't know. Whalen ended the conversation by punching Piscatel in the mouth, knocked him off the chair onto the floor. Then he turned around, he took one of the dining chairs, he raised it up over his head like he was going to smack uh, this guy, La Signa, supposedly. Um, 
and he said, you're next, you dago bastard. Well, who knows? But that's when Lasigno, this is another guy, claimed that he had pulled out a gun and he started shooting because he was terrified just of Whalen's reputation alone. He said he had a gun because his apartment had been broken into about a month before. So he went to this guy, Willie Greensburg, and he, for 35 bucks, he got a gun and he kept it in a love compartment of his car. The Cigna later on said he didn't know who Whalen was, but it, which contradicts his whole thing about the, uh, he was terrified of him. He said later on that he was afraid of Whalen because he had heard that he had knocked out a policeman who owed money uh, with a single shot to the head, knocked the policeman unconscious. Uh, a year before that, he says a bartender told him that when Whalen had put the owner of a bar up against the wall and beaten him until the bar owner said, give him all the money in the register before he kills me. Um, that was made up. He, apparently, I think he just made I mean, Whalen was crazy, and he beat people up. Um, that story was something that the signal needed to cover his claim that he was afraid he was going to lose his life. Uh, the signal says that when Whalen yelled, now nah, you dago bastard, blah, 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 I'm going to kill you, that he grabbed his gun, he fired two shots. One went into the ceiling, and the second one, these guys couldn't have been, if you look at the floor plan there, um, five feet from each other, and he put the next shot right directly into Whalen's forehead, and he kills him. And then Lasigno runs out of the place. He goes into hiding for seven days. Uh, finally, he surrenders to the priest, uh, to the police, rather, I'm sorry, and he says he shot uh, him, but he shot him in, in self-defense. Uh, and they said, well, where's the gun? He said, I, I can't remember where the gun is right now, but uh, I mean, this, this whole thing was... Suspicious. In the meantime, the story starts that maybe it was a crooked cop that shot Whalen. What had happened was a few days before the murder, someone, it was probably either Whalen, his lawyer, or his father, called the state attorney general's office. And he said that Whalen was ready to blow the lid off the LAPD. He was going to identify all the cops. They had to pay all the time, that they were he was sick of being shaken down. Uh, so the press got wind of that from Cohen. Cohen said, you know, he was going to rat out the cops and blah, blah, blah. So they start a story. Well, maybe, you know, maybe it was the cops. Whalen's father, Fred. Fred was a one-time big dollar pool hustler. Uh, he made a lot of money in Prohibition by buying up a series of motorboats, really fast motorboats, made them faster and brought booze in from Mexico and all points into California. Made a lot of money. He said, Mickey Cohen, as good as pull the trigger and everybody knows it. Uh, Fred, he was called Freddy the Thief. He let it be known that he was going to shoot Cohen dead. And Cohen let it be known that he wouldn't let him do that. He said, quote, he has my invitation to come out and see me anytime. You know, Fred was right, of course. Cohen, it was actually Cohen who pulled the pistol out and shot Whalen through the skull in the restaurant. By the way, a few weeks after the murder of his son, Fred Whalen, who was considerably older, uh, than these guys. He tracked down that singer, Anthony Amirino, Amirino the guy who was on the phone, and uh, he beat him damn near senseless. Uh, Fred was almost 70 at the time. Whalen was 25. Anyway, a little bit later, several guns are found, uh, but not the murder weapon, in a trash can outside the restaurant. One of them was uh, Cohen's infamous ivy colored handle 38. So Sergeant Jack O'Mara, who had been with the infamous gangster squad, he had retired by this time, showed up at the court, and he said when the hearing started to uh, for the murder, he said that he had a, a security guard who worked on Cohen's property uh, that was an informer for him. The guy's name was Neil Hawkins. And he said he sent Hawkins into Cohen's home in June of 1950, take all the pistols he could find and bring to the police station, where he said... I marked them inside the butt plate. And then he had them returned to Cohen's home. Um, he didn't hear about it again until the shooting. So Amara proved that the three guns they had found in the trash can outside the restaurant did, in fact, belong to Cohen. To prove it, he undid the gun, unscrewed the plate, and showed a K. He had scratched K. Uh, onto each of the pistols, and they said it was C. It was CX was the next letter, so K C X one, K C X two, C X three, and they said was that Cohen? He said no, it was just a number. I didn't have any reason for it. So the defense, this did more harm than good. Said well, you planted these guns, 
and for all we know, you threw those guns in the trash because my client, Mickey Cohen, is an upstanding guy. He would never do such a thing. And it, he meant well, O'Meara meant well, but it really blew the case for the, for the uh, prosecution. Anyway, on the day the jury began deliberating, it's just a side note here, uh, Cohen decides he's going to go see Joey Bishop, the comic at the Cloisters. Uh, some drunk, he gets out of the car with, he had a party of four with him. He gets out of the car, this drunk leaps into this beautiful Cadillac. Cohen's dog, who was with him all the time, is still in the back seat, and the drunk races off. So Cohen screams, follow that guy, Max Bear known to people my age as Jethro for the Beverly Hillbillies. His father was the infamous heavyweight champion, uh, was part of Cohen's regular entourage. He leaps in his car. Cohen jumps in through the passenger side window, believe it or not, and they give chase through the streets of L.A. 100 miles an hour at some point. Finally, the drunk is terrified, and he sees a police station in Hollywood, and he pulls in, and he surrenders to the cops. So the jury comes back the next day. The signals found guilty first degree murder. Uh, and the recommendation is life in prison. So this is not what he had agreed to. Uh, the way the signal heard it, he would get $25,000 from Cohen for saying, I killed Whalen. And he believed that Cohen would arrange for him to get 10 years and they'd serve around four, three or four years for 25000 in roughly 1960, a lot of money, but it blew up in his face. They give him, <laughs> they give him life. So he's now he's shocked. He tries to get up. Here's the thing with the signal. He was really just a gopher, a flunky for Cohen, uh, for Mickey Cohen. He limped when he walked. Uh, he had this bent over, walking forward sort of a thing. He had broken his back in a car accident. He had injuries, permanent injuries to his neck and his arm and his chest. Uh, he was still receiving treatment years after the, after the, he had been medically discharged from the U.S. Army. Um, and he had a diet that made him, give him a special diet. He couldn't touch this. It had bad stomach problems. So he had wandered to California in 1944. He was working as an asphalt worker and then as a bartender, and just later on, is essentially Cohen's valet. He would shine his shoes, drive his car, that sort of thing. So years later, Cohen writes, quote, Sam Lasigno, who was accused of the hit, couldn't hit the wall of an auditorium with a shotgun. And then according to him, Lasigno agreed to take the murder rap for 25000 cash, everything I just told you. So Lasigno is now facing life, and he thinks, this, this is not going to happen. And he goes to the prosecution and he, he asks for a new trial. Judge says, I don't see any reason. You said you did it. And no. The signal then goes to the prosecutor and says, look, this is all wrong. Um, I took 25 grand. I didn't, I don't even know how to shoot a gun. And long story short, there was a lot of wrangling going on in there. And after a lot of this complicated legal maneuvers, the signal is acquitted in long story short, Whalen's murder. So why didn't Cohen go to jail? Well, after the trial, a federal grand jury began to look into Cohen's incredibly lavish lifestyle uh, that he said he got by in 1200 a month. He was selling plants and uh, ice cream in his store. So he tried to fight. Cohen tried to fight this grand jury. He said, this is double jeopardy since I had been tried for this once before. In fact, only, uh, I think, a year before by, for, by the IRS. And the grand jury said, oh, we don't care. They slammed him away 15 years federal prison. In federal prison, Cohen is attacked. He's struck with a lead pipe by this inmate named Burl Estes McDonald. McDonald had climbed over a wall. They were in different sections of the prison. He had climbed over a wall with barbed wire on top of it, jumped down, broke into an electronic shop, stole a, a pipe, a lead pipe, and found, wandered back in over the wall, found Cohen walking around and cracked him in the head uh, so hard that fractured, he fractured his skull and fragments of the skull were in the brain tissue and it hemorrhaged and it was just, a, you can imagine, a mess. Cohen wanted one surgery after, neurosurgeries after another. He was in a coma for two weeks. They put a steel plate in his head. 
but it was a mess. And after that, he spoke with a sort of a slur and he would occasionally wander off um, in, in mid-sentence, that sort of thing. But hell, I do that. So every account had it that uh, this guy, McDonald, was deranged. and But he was taken to a psychiatrist, series of psychiatrists, because they charged him for this uh, criminal charges. And all these psychiatrists said, no, he's fine. There's nothing wrong with this guy. The only one who probably had the right story was the Jack O'Meara, the one-time member of the Gangster Squad. He said that he believed Fred Whalen paid this guy McDonald to go in, find Cohen, and crack his skull open. He told me Amira said that he's going to get Mickey. The last thing I do, Amira, I'm going to get that son of a bitch. And, and he did. So uh, when he got out of prison, Mickey Cohen got out of prison, he died uh, really short time later. He didn't live a long life. I think he's 62, 63 when he died. Uh,